Hello, I'm Natia Trapaidze. In the 1990s, a sensational statement was reported by the Georgian press. In the mountains of the Republic of Georgia, there's a large, closed, sacral cave, which resembles a whale, resting on boulders laid on a massive turtle, and projecting from the top of it an astral axis of the universe. Some other very interesting facts were also put forward. For some, it seemed convincing enough. The author of those articles is the Georgian esoteric writer Givi Alazni Spirelli. In his point of view, in addition to the actual structure of the universe, this discovery has also revealed the root cause of devastating earthquakes. I went to find out what we're dealing with by interviewing him. Mr. Pirelli, maybe you could briefly explain the content of this innovative documentary series to those with limited time. Yes, I think so. The population of today's Earth has been embraced by information chaos. People are so overwhelmed by the news that I doubt everyone would watch this film all the way through. According to my point of view, the center of the universe is located inside the Earth, namely beneath the region of the Caucasus, and represents the very epicenter of space-time. Look at this. Today, this emptiness is filled with a hydrogen sulfide mass, which I have marked in black. Inside this deadliest dark substance, there is the supershine Ra, i.e. Ramzi, described by the ancient Egyptians, and in the depth between them, the discharge happening from time to time, causing powerful earthquakes. You're talking about the inner sphere of the Earth. Why did you mention the word deadly? It is common knowledge that there is no sign of life in the hydrogen sulfide layer. As for that shining glimmer, it is characterized by the ancients as a super phenomenon, which says that if we throw a dead butterfly into it, it will revive and fly out again. Thus, we are dealing with two extremely antagonistic phenomena in relation to each other, the deadly dark substance and, on the other hand, the source of life. Anyone who is interested in this topic should watch this film to the end and I will promise their worldview will change. But it will be changed not by me, but by the ingenuity of the theory. I learnt it from the ancient Georgian esoteric manuscripts. Mr. Pirelli, you call yourself an esoteric. Could you explain what esotericism is and why for centuries it has been taboo? Nowadays, the word esotericism is often used. It has become a kind of trend. But I don't think everyone knows what this sacred science is. I will explain it now. I was flying horizontally back then. At an abnormal speed. Those who saw it would know it. As if I slipped through and... I went through a huge funnel. But there was a miraculous light. I found myself in a totally empty space. There is probably no word on earth to describe this feeling. I held out my arms like the wings of a plane taking to the sky. And I passed through the tunnel. I suddenly saw the light and I landed back on my feet. I saw what hell looks like. In the previous years, I used an illustration of an egg as an example. By some providence, an egg is round, but still it's not round as it's full and massive from the inside, yet one spot is there. I think everyone has peeled a boiled egg and is aware of it, and there's no need to prove it. What can you conclude from this? Back in the 1990s, I published the following concept in the Georgian press. If the paradox applies to eggs, why shouldn't this phenomenon be presented inside the Earth? 
Let me scale it up. Especially since the Sumerians used to compare our planet to an egg. The Earth is massive inside. Massive as it is, it must be hollow somewhere. As our planet is round, the scientific world has proven that the Earth is not round. It's an ellipsoid. Over the past 30 years, I've been familiarizing myself with famous manuscripts of the authors of ancient lost civilizations, the scripts that are still preserved. Every author describes some unearthly light shining within the earth. What are we dealing with? This is the area due to which the esoteric field was created that studies the structure and essence of the mentioned underground space. How can you prove to scientific circles that something is shining in the depths of our planet? I decided to confirm this great finding and starting from my youth, I began searching for the people who had experienced clinical death, whom I could trust, and I recorded interviews with them. Let me start discussing this discovery with some mysticism, and then I will move on to physics. And, based on the structure of the atoms, I will prove that there must really be hollowness and shining inside the Earth. This is an imminent phenomenon on a planetary scale. However, unfortunately, the topic I'm going to discuss now is unacceptable to the scientific community. They're skeptical about it. But I feel awkward to have been giving society the same example of the Earth and egg analogies for decades. Now I will explain the essence of esotericism in another way. When a person dies, their soul comes out of their bodies and enters some dark and very long black tunnel. At the opposite end of this tunnel, the soul is hosted by a phenomenon of unearthly brightness. The souls realize that there is a super shining accumulated there from which nobody wants to return. This is clinical death. What and how can those who go away forever after death and never return tell us about what they saw in the black tunnel or in that underworld? But there are some exceptions, and this is a consequence of the paradox law. When they return from clinical death and tell us such strange stories that modern-day skeptics find hard to believe. I have decided to create a documentary film where mysticism and physics, modern knowledge and experience will be considered simultaneously and using credible logical facts, I will try to explain to scientists what we are dealing with in terms of the shining the people who come back from are talking about. This is the subject of the ancient Colchians that was studied by the sacral scientific field called esotericism. I always ask my respondents, who were there spiritually, if at least they can roughly imagine where that superlight is. Not roughly, but I know it exactly. I'll be honest with you, I had never seen the place before. 
Everything was lit, everything was shining. You know what that space was like? Always before my eyes. I had no ability to judge or think there. I watched as I was passing by to see what was going on, where I was. Absolute reality. It was so good. I have read your articles. You say that a turtle and a whale made of boulders and lime are discovered on the territory of Georgia, namely in Imereti. And how is it connected to earthquakes? The ancient Japanese blamed earthquakes on whales. As a result of almost 30 years of research, I have come to the conclusion that earthquakes are caused by the whale or turtle, or they act separately, or they may represent a joint mechanism. Sure, in the early eras there was less knowledge. Some laid blame on the whale, some blamed the giant turtle. The Japanese of past centuries blamed giant fish for earthquakes, mainly of the catfish type. Here is an old image where a Japanese emperor sends his servants to attack a catfish to prevent earthquakes. But anyway, the story of a turtle and a whale vanished from the memory of mankind, and today it exists just as a legend. I wonder how scientists explain the phenomenon of earthquakes. I have discussed this topic with one of the Georgian academics, a professor who heads a seismologist's group in Tbilisi. See what he has told me. Today, the origin of earthquakes is imagined as follows. There are tectonic plates of various sizes that move. Tectonic plates are coarse forms and they move at the depth of about 100 to 200 kilometers below the Earth. There is a layer, a so-called asthenosphere, which is represented as a semi-melted, more of a liquid nature. Though very viscous liquid, and it produces convective cells. Tectonic plates float on these convective cells, moving and following the currents caused by the convective cells of the asthenosphere. Where it's hot, that cell rises and moves, while cooler cells go down. This movement is accompanied by tectonic flagstones. In some places they occur below oceanic tectonic flagstones. While in some places continental flagstones rub themselves against each other. In the places where tectonic flagstones make contact, they cause earthquakes. I personally do not deny the fact that there are giant flagstones deep in the earth. If it's not so, then what are the states based upon? But I disagree with the scientists, and it is impossible that mere motions of flagstones would cause earthquakes. I would rather offer seismologists a different perspective on what power can shake or move those flagstones. And what was the scientist's response? I stopped an academician and asked, let's say earthquakes are caused by giant tectonic plates and their motions or mutual frictions. Here I'm wondering where the huge amount of energy comes from, which you will be amazed to hear. Let's have one example. On March the 11th, 2011, so much energy was suddenly revealed inside the Earth, and it caused such a giant tsunami that it washed away the entire coast of northern Japan. What amount of energy are you talking about? It's been calculated. 
ამ დათვლის შედეგად მიღებულია რომ მილიონი კილოტონი As a result, we may conclude that this is equal to the energy of a 100 megaton atomic bomb. ეს თქვა ბომბის ენერგია არის ნუ კილო ეს ითვლება When calculated in TNT, this number is equivalent to a one billion kiloton TNT bomb. The atomic bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki each provided 32 kilotons. If we divide the billion by 32, it turns out that the Japanese earthquake produced 32.25 times more energy than the bomb that exploded in Nagasaki. Huge energy. It should be defined that before the Earth shakes somewhere, that energy must be stored in some form. Well, see, at the moment of the earthquake, an invisible wave is spreading across the Earth, which can be recorded by any seismograph. And if that energy is kept inside our planet even before earthquakes, why can't seismic devices record it? I believe that the invisible wave is not caused by the frictions of underground flagstones or by their motions. And don't you agree with the principles of science? There are lots of films about it on the internet, and it would be good to see them. For example, a foreign seismologist claims that the March 11th, 2011 earthquake produced so much energy by Japan's northern coast that it was equivalent to about 500,000 atomic bombs of the size used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It is impossible that such energy would suddenly appear inside the Earth when no similar action was observed in water earlier, just seconds before. That's the whole difficulty of predicting earthquakes. That energy accumulates in the depths of our planet. If we talk about surface earthquakes, the source of which is tens of kilometers deep, they may refer to one class of earthquakes. The second class refers to more subduction earthquakes which are created hundreds of kilometers deep. When it is 10 or 100 kilometers deep, we are not able to observe what exactly is going on at that depth. Mr. Pirelli, do you think the mystical tunnel where souls that have left their bodies are wandering, is it in the sky? It's not in the sky. I didn't pass through the tunnel. I passed through it and suddenly found myself in a cave that was illuminated. It's inside the earth, not in the sky. This is the reality, and if you have not experienced it, you may not be able to believe it. I'll be happy to see the day when I visit that place again. How did the sun end up inside the earth? Listen to them. They have been there. It was not like the sun shining. It wasn't the sun. I didn't see the sun there. No, there was no sun. It was a very beautiful color. The situation there is like... I went down there and I saw a cave. In the past years, I have recorded several interviews with people who had suffered a brief death. And witnessed something upon which they tell us miraculous things. They were in an unearthly environment, as if the sun was shining while it was not the sun. 
There is beautiful nature there. Their spiritual journey begins with a black tunnel through which they pass. The rest they tell themselves. I'll show you several interviews in this film which make this argument. This is not my imagination. These are credible facts that a person can really come out of the body and spiritually see the light. I'm going to tell you about them in this seven-part film, a truly ingenious topic. Natia. It's a well-known theme, and in many countries, books have been published about being spiritually present somewhere while in a state of clinical death. But where that place is, no one knows. However, according to my theory, when a soul that has left a body passes through a black and long tunnel, and at the end of that tunnel it is hosted by a super light full of love, where heaven is found, all this is happening inside the proton of the universe. But tell me honestly, does anyone know about what I've just spoken? So when did that happen to you? I came back home from work one night. It had just gone 11. My husband told me, nothing hurts, though I'm sweating hard, so please give me a towel. He cleansed his face. I kept sitting there for a while. I felt unwell and lay down. I had a headache. And I see now, I stood up, found my medicine, reached out for a glass. However, we've never found out whether I took the medicine or not. We had a low sofa in the bedroom back then. Though I didn't lie down on the sofa, I lay down on the floor and I remember I was asking my husband, Misha, what happened to me? Give me a hand. I want to lie down on the sofa. I don't know how I found myself on the sofa. I was found unconscious. I remember nothing more until I woke up the next day at about five in the evening. I wonder. You were dead for a few hours, I presume? Yes. During this time, your body was motionless. Where were you? What did you see? You know, I'll be honest with you. I've never seen that place, but... Do you remember passing through a tunnel? I held out my arms like the wings of a plane taking to the sky. And as I passed through the tunnel, I suddenly saw the light and I landed back on my feet. I looked around. I was wondering, where am I? And what I saw was a field a green field, a wheat field. There was low grass, no roads, no footsteps on it. It wasn't trampled on. And there were bushes of roses with leaves and stems here and there. I didn't see any flowers in bloom. Here is the first comment. I read the well-known book by an American researcher and writer, Dr. Raymond Moody, called Life After Death. 
He visited about a hundred patients, talked with them and recorded interviews, and then published it all in a book. I have tried to contact Mr. Moody on the internet several times, but to no avail. I wanted to tell him that a black and long tunnel, where souls start their way, is actually found. And this is a dipole of the universe. I'm going to discuss that issue in this film, but does any physicist know what I've just talked about? Most of those interviewed by Mr. Moody recall beautiful nature. Most importantly, where they stood, there was a wheat field. It's interesting since my respondents also noted that they were standing in a wheat field. It's out of the question that all those who experienced clinical deaths on different continents would agree on telling something stupid. No, that doesn't make sense to me. And since the narratives of patients from different countries match, and the majority find themselves in the middle of green grass and in the greatest brightness, after all, it is the 21st century in space, and we do have to realize that this is true. And if that tunnel does not exist at all, what do these people see? Do they tell lies? I once assumed that perhaps that is an illusion. I saw films on the internet about it. I was confused by the conclusion of neurosurgeons, saying that it is caused by irritation of the neurons during trepanation. What does the soul have to do with it? For them it is unbelievable. Unfortunately, modern scientific circles have failed to perceive. And it's time to acknowledge that. Mrs. Margalita, you've suffered from a clinical death. Would you please tell us what happened, when it happened, what do you remember? What I remember, that was back in 1985. I bled during childbirth. Against this background, DIC syndrome developed, which made me pass out. I remember how I was coming out of the body. It was disgusting. The mass or my physical body looked like gelatin. I was confused, shocked, and I suddenly felt relieved. When I came out of this mass, I was standing next to the doctor looking at my body. I was surprised. Have I really been inside this mass? Confused, I'm watching, wondering what's going on, where am I? Suddenly, I find myself in a field full of poppies. I remember how that field was waving. I had a feeling of happiness, something that I can't describe. Probably there are no words to describe that feeling. I always ask my respondents what they experienced, what was the first thing they saw, or whether they remained there for a moment or immediately moved to another unearthly space, what they saw there afterwards or when it all happened.
It happened in 1995. It was March. I needed surgery. I was anesthetized before the operation. The anesthesiologist was a friend of mine, and I jokingly asked him to properly bring me out of my body. He also jokingly encouraged me and told me he would arrange a trip for me. I'm afraid of injections, but I had to put up with it. Probably a few minutes had passed, the anesthesia started to take effect, and I found myself in an unnatural situation. I found myself in an absolutely empty space. It felt like imagining a starry sky. I know something about constellations, though at that moment I was unable to define them. The space was so full of stars, I was amazed. In fact, I was spiritually out of my body. There I heard the sound of the space. I will never forget it. Everything was buzzing, something like this. I don't know how the sound spreads there and how a physicist would explain it, but I could actually hear that sound. A few seconds later, the space turned from left to right, and a funnel appeared similar to a photo camera, which is a diaphragm that expands and shrinks. And I went out into that huge funnel of the illuminated starry sky at an abnormal speed. I want to believe that whatever you are talking about is true. What would recognition of this theory give to the world? First of all, thus revealed the cause of the strong earthquakes I talked about. In addition, the idea of making this film was motivated by two alarming conclusions. I will now explain this issue to you. In the Republic of Georgia, the wheat field today is called Kana. It is surprising that the underworld, about which we will come to later, is called Kvekana, meaning country, or literally underland in religious old Georgian manuscripts. Or rather, in the old-fashioned way, Kvekana. We Georgians should understand that enormous information is kept in our language in this regard. Whoever created the word Kuekana knew that there was a Kana, i.e. lower wheat field, somewhere underneath. The Old and New Testament manuscripts, as well as the texts of the saints, are full of this word Kuekana. See what we are dealing with. We know that the Bible begins like this. The glorious prophet Moses describes how the universe was created, who created it, in how many days it was created, and so on. I wondered where the first humans appeared from on the surface of the earth. The prophet Moses, in Old Georgian Old Testament, describes the episode this way. Initially, a man came up from the underworld. But when I read it in different languages, for example, I translated this excerpt from French, English, Russian. This episode of the Bible is unclear. When I read this in the modern Georgian Bible, I mean the third script of our alphabets, I was still confused and I still couldn't perceive where a man came from on earth. However, 
It was enough to refer to the old Georgian version of the Bible, which was written in our first alphabet before our era, and even earlier. Those are very old manuscripts. I noticed that the words came up were used there, and they said the following. A man first appeared below, in the Kuekana, or underland, and later they settled on the upper land, which in our language in ancient times was called the Kuekanasa Zeda, i.e. the upper part of the wheat field, and means the upper place of the lower space. Upon coming up from below, men begin to reproduce on the upper part of the underland, i.e. on the upper land. Let's evaluate the situation together. If we, the population of the earth, are an underland, no matter if it is our Georgia or any other territory, it turns out that man originated on the surface of our planet and then went up to the upper part of the wheat field and was flying above somewhere. This is not true. Moreover, we have not been able to find Eden or Paradise to this day. And when I explored our ancient biblical texts, it became clear that the Kuekana was an underworld, and man came up from there to the upper part of the wheat field. And this is our Georgia. Now I'm going to move on to another very interesting and topical issue and see where we're going to end up. There is an episode in the Old Testament when the prophet Ezekiel saw the revelation. Lord Adonai told him what was to come in our time and asked him to warn his people. I began to read carefully to see what the Lord was saying to Ezekiel, or what his people meant, and the country located between two seas described there was our country, so-called the country of winds. This name was given to us by the Sumerians, but before that the name of our country was Huristan. The Supreme God, speaking to Ezekiel, is described in the Old Testament. Let's read the following before I explain it in my language. I have a Bible. Here it is. But while I look for this excerpt, we may lose some time. So I have written it out. The Supreme says, If when Ebguri seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. The Bible was not created in our third script. These are the texts of the earlier version of the Bible, the second version of the Georgian alphabet which we call Nushor Khutsuri. Let me comment on what this text deals with. The Ebguri, i.e. watchman, must come first. Who is he? I have looked through the Georgian dictionaries created by our teachers of the past centuries. Here is the following explanation. Egbori means a guardian, a watchman of the universe, a warner, a predictor of the future, who will soon appear. 
Anu monaulis sem curateli. Romelis male gamochende bau. Anu is wins adre vega igus. Amam bau. That is, those who discover early something that is going to happen in one of the regions of the Earth. In fact, they must inform their people in advance. If he realizes that this is expected and he remains silent, frightened, hides away and does not speak, the text contains a threat to him. And if the watchman of our time delivers it, but the listener ignores the warning, it becomes his problem. Something like this is said in the modern language. Why I bring this excerpt from the Old Georgian Bible? There is the information where that beam will appear. I've just read to you the Old Georgian version of this prophecy. Natio, where will this happen? Did you get it? Now I will present an Old Georgian version of this same quote. Please note that here is mentioned the Kwe Kanasa Zeda, i.e. upon the lower wheat field. This concept means the land of the Republic of Georgia. If when Ebgori seeth the sword come upon the Kwe Kanasa Zeda, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. That is, whoever will take action will survive. One more question. Does this apply to our territory as a whole? No way. This applies to one region only. It does not apply to the whole of Georgia. Nothing like a catastrophe is going to happen. However, one circumstance motivated me to say this out loud. This will cause terrible panic among our population. I also know it will cause panic, and it may happen so that no one would even see this film on TV or on the internet, and it will be spread by word of mouth among the population that according to Givi Alaznis Pirelli, we will fail. When will it happen? What can we as local people do about it? Natia, that's why I'm telling you in advance what was the motivation, the main reason why I made a fuss over the past years, first with the help of my personal newspaper, then with my books, and now already with this documentary. In the near future, a strange shimmering will appear in the sky. Maybe it will look like the sun, though I don't know what scientists will call it, a comet or an asteroid. This was also predicted to us by the Sumerians. Their manuscripts state that a planet object called Nibiru will appear in the sky at the end of time, and in some places it is written as Nebiru. The prophecy of this lies in almost every religion. So, wherever I looked through old books and read, those are the manuscripts of the Maya peoples, Peru or Babylonian civilizations, this is described everywhere. A great mystery will be revealed at the end of time. This is also written by Muhammad in his book. When that shimmering appears, do you know what will be happening on Earth? How will the world be reassured? Then how to explain to the population that the super shimmering would enter only the territory of Georgia at midnight? And, as it is written in the Old Testament, according to the prophecy of Zechariah, it would be spread from valley to valley. That's all. Then will begin the triumph of our Georgia. We will become a super state. What bothers me the most, when that super light appears in the sky, 
Some foreign scientists will write that it is hot lead. Others will say that this is molten copper. Some will tell us that it is a gas. Some will say another foolish thing like that this is a 30-ton or a 300-ton huge substance and it's approaching the Earth. People, can you imagine what panic is going to break out on Earth? Wouldn't it be better that I say it first today? Well, we'll be frightened a bit, but what's the problem? Isn't it worthwhile to be a little scared at this point in order to survive? We will survive. When pulling out a tooth, it's more painful than it was before. Why do you pull out your teeth? Because later you will be fine, right? My son and I have been making this documentary for four years. You can see by my expression, I'm so tired. This also refers to my speech. I work day and night. I need financial assistance. The film urgently needs to be translated into different languages. English, French, German, Russian, Hindi. So that this news can be heard in India as well. How can we benefit from it? If we do the second, third and the final, seventh part of this film, I will present such arguments to humanity that come not only from the Bible or from ancient knowledge. I will also make such an innovation in the language of modern physicists that no one could refuse it and treat it as incorrect. It is all very logical, and I can confirm it based on my 30 years of experience. But it makes sense not because I'm Givi and it's based on my merits. I started the film this way. The topic itself is so powerful that very soon it will defeat all illogical arguments. If you wish that to correct the dipole of the universe, let's take good care of our George immediately and save it. And when that dipole's field passes quietly over the territory of the Republic of Georgia, there will not be so many earthquakes anymore, nor will there be those great hailstorms or floods. Then you will see how the whole of humanity will improve, both rich countries and poor states. If not, God knows what awaits the world. I have spoken, and the ancients also have spoken. Natia, the first part of the documentary is over. That's enough. <laughs>